this week on Core Talk. Right now, this is the top performing reef project in Chesapeake Bay because we've done something that's really not, not been seen before in, in the bay and uh, I'm just really thrilled to death that it's outperformed my goal metrics. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. We're a team of professionals, biologists, engineers, real estate and administrative specialists, lawyers, and many other specialties, all working together to deliver engineering solutions that are vital to securing our nation, energizing our economy, and reducing disaster risks. Safely, on time, and within budget. This is Core Talk, the USAFE's Norfolk District podcast. From harbor port deepening and coastal storm risk management to environmental restoration and research and development, we exist to serve our community because we are a part of it. SAONs. 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 Let us try. All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Core Talk. I'm James Walker. And I'm Tony Funkhauser. And I understand today's podcast is called A Legacy of Continued Improvement. Uh, yeah, that's right, sir. But before we get started, I understand you have two children, right? I do, six and three, yeah. I have two teenagers, one that's just joined the Army. And over the last year, we've, me and my wife, we've also acquired a one-year-old as well, a toddler. And I remember when she was still expecting our youngest, I was concerned, I was worried. What did I do right and what did I do wrong with the first two? How do I know that I'm going to do a good job with this with this new infant that I have in, in the home? And one day when I was out on Broad Bay, I brought some of these concerns up to Scott Titus while, while they were deploying the ROV, the underwater drone, to check up on one of the, the oyster reefs out there. And he said something to me, and I'm paraphrasing, but it kind of went like this. I've learned that as a parent, it's simply my job to be there, to be an example, to provide assistance and guidance when needed, and to make things easier. Things are kind of going to evolve the way that they turn out, and I can't control that. But what I can do is help them figure things out. It's not something to worry about. Just keep talking about it. Keep being there. Keep doing it. Yep. And today, the reason why I love that perspective so much is because it kind of reminds me of the perspective that I see that many of our Norfolk District professionals and partners are maintaining as they work to provide those useful, effective engineering solutions for the nation and the Commonwealth and then, you know, all of the communities within. So I'm excited about this particular episode because we haven't done one quite like it. Well, how so? Well, firstly, sir, because you weren't there. <laughs> and <laughs> Call me out. On that topic, where, where were you? Uh, yeah, yeah, so I was uh, at Holston and Radford uh, Ammunition Plants okay. where we're doing some uh, walkthroughs of our construction projects as well as an executive offsite. So yeah, a lot of fun. I apologize that I missed it out. <laughs> no, no worries at all. This time we actually recorded a remote conversation. We were in a classroom at Christopher Newport University. As soon as we walked in, you could just smell the oysters. The oysters were laid out in these trays all over the back of the room. And the first individual we engaged with was a university professor and a career biologist. And the other two were biologists from USA's Norfolk District. They pretty much discussed with us the Lynn Haven River Basin Ecosystem Restoration Project. Well, that's cool. So we're going to talk about that, really looking at the, the three types of habitats that we engage in, which is the wetlands, the submerged aquatic vegetation, as well as the, uh, the hard reef for the oysters. Okay, I'll take that back. So I misspoke. So in this particular episode, we're going to be focusing primarily on the hard reef restoration efforts. Okay, okay. No, that's cool. And I, I think if I remember correctly, it was uh, we wanted about 31 acres of hard oyster reef uh, built within this project, right? Right, that's correct. Okay. So I would list them out who they were, but just you know what, just go ahead and listen. Okay. My name is Russell Burke. I am an environmental biologist at Christopher Newport University's Department of Organismal and Environmental Biology. And I got into oysters during graduate school early on. I met a fellow named Dave Schulte, and he was already on a quest, and I decided to join the quest. And apparently we're still on it. <laughs> uh, Dave Schulte, I've been the lead scientist on the Army Corps Oyster Restoration Program for 24 years plus and counting. I've planned and designed all of our oyster restoration projects and I was the lead planner on the Lynn Haven Ecosystem Restoration Project, which is what we're talking about today, this reef system here. Heather Lockwood, I'm a project manager in our programs and civil works branch at the Norfolk District. 
and I got into oysters in undergraduate school uh, at Coastal Carolina in a um, marine aquatic and invasive species class. And we just started talking about oysters one day and we actually started talking about um, the one of the parasitic diseases that impact oysters, dermo. And that kind of ignited a, a little passion I didn't know I had. And then um, flash forward to working for Chesapeake Bay Foundation as their oyster restoration specialist. And then um, lucky enough to then keep that oyster path going now at the core. All right. So, sir, I kind of want to share with you some of the examples I found of the legacy of continued improvement that the Corps has been involved in for some time now. In Channel 13 News, oyster populations are on the rise in Chesapeake Bay. In the Virginia Mercury, oysters are rebounding in Virginia waters. The Bay Foundation says it's time to expand efforts. And according to the Southern Maryland News, Chesapeake Oyster Alliance celebrates 6 billion oysters added to the Bay since 2017. Wow. Finally, according to the Oyster Recovery Partnership, efforts since the early 2000s in the Chesapeake Bay have culminated in the successful planting of more than 1.5 billion juvenile oysters in 2023 alone. So I have to mention that this all comes subsequent to the Chesapeake Bay Watershed Agreement of 2014. Since then, USACE has collaborated with various federal and state partners, state organizations to fully restore a number of Chesapeake Bay tributaries for oyster habitats by 2025. But still, I can't help but think that, you know, for those who aren't involved in those projects, for those who are just passing by these these tributaries, these, these, these waterways every single day, the question still has to come to mind. Why are oysters so important? And why or how is the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers involved? So of the Lynn Haven goal for the hardwood habitat, we have the 31 acres. So for phase one, it was eight acres that we completed. And that's where we're going to be um, touching on today some of the, the wins and some of the results from monitoring and all the efforts that Christopher Newport University and Virginia Institute of Marine Science has done um, and, and seen through the monitoring efforts uh, over the past year. We've had our first year of, of monitoring results come in. But one of the things to note, too, is the challenges to get here. And I think that's what makes this success story of how great our reef is looking now even more important because not only, um, you know, did we 20 years ago have questions about the native oyster population, are we going to introduce a non-native? But and so we had this overarching like biological issue and problem. But then there was also um, it was, you know, the core kind of had this effort, this Lynn Haven effort, this Lynn Haven study um, in the early 2000s trying to move forward. We, we, we had a bunch of challenges before my time, but, um, you know, a bunch of challenges we were reaching. And then we get to 2014 with the Chesapeake Bay Watershed Agreement which kind of really, in my eyes, again, this is when I just started getting into the oyster world, it brought so many different agencies together, both both federal and non-federal, non-profits, um, and uh, local governments together. And and then really um, NOAA kind of created these little work groups to identify and work through some of the targeted tributaries that were mentioned, uh, that are mentioned to restore by 2025. And that was one of the things that when I first, again, got into the oyster world was the best part was these interagency meetings that know the work groups that NOAA led and then the core held quarterly interagency meetings and just seeing folks from CNU, from VIMS, from um, uh, Chesapeake Bay Foundation, Lynn Hamburg River Now, the city of Virginia Beach, um, Elizabeth River Project, all of us going towards this common goal of um, whatever tributary we're working on, specifically like for today, we were talking about Lynn Haven. So the results from our Lynn Haven River Basin project from phase one helped get us further. And it was one of the ways that the core is is part of that, that major overarching project and the partnerships that we have there. And um, I think this will also, I mean, we all in the oyster world, we're all oyster people. We all understand the lingo. We understand the benefits. But something that we've seen is that the public doesn't. And I think this is finally a, a way to say why we've pushed so hard, why we pushed so hard to get phase one in all the reef balls. I mean, I think it was very overwhelming for the public to know that there were 28,000 reef balls going into the water because they, they didn't understand it. And now we can say why, which will then help 
we've already, you know, we're have plans for phase two for the 23 acres in phase two, but I think it'll help justify why we've pushed so hard and why, even though we've come so far, why there, there is still work to be done. You see? Yeah, it's interesting. Like, it's funny to see how problem solving has no ends. Like, we're problem solving everywhere, right? So it's just one of those things to make sure that we're, we're understanding, you know, do we have the facts, assumptions, constraints? Do we have the research and the tools to be able to, to solve the right problem, right? right? So we're thinking about that. At the end of the day, we always need to be flexible and adaptable as a situation changes. And I think that's what we're getting at right now is that Definitely. Um, over time, we're, we're seeing things and we're evolving as an organization. Uh, interacting with our partners, stakeholders, ourselves. Um, we understand we're still trying to solve the same problem, but the game has changed over time, right? So we have to be able to do that. I think that's the same way that we talk about uh, the Army in general. We're constantly changing and shifting um, as um, our enemy is changing and shifting, right? Exactly. So we're doing that here. It's a little bit different concept, but it's also you know driving, um, striving towards that same kind of end state with problem solving. So I think that was really cool to listen to that piece. I think the other piece of it too really gets at are, are we understanding the information that we're receiving and are we able to process it and um, get after what we're trying to accomplish in, in this uh, reef restor- or this oyster restoration? And it's the fact that there are so many, one, there's so many different organizations that are partnered and collaborated in, this, in these projects, but then even within Norfolk District, there's so many different disciplines that are involved in, oh, yeah. in the planning, the tracking o- over time that really help bring these things to a successful fruition. Yeah, 100%. I think it's the it's the entire village of the Norfolk District that you know comes together to accomplish what we're trying to do here. It is a village. It is, 100%. <laughs> SAV had experienced severe diebacks in the Lynn Haven River uh, due to a variety of reasons, and it was basically extirpated from the Lynn Haven in about 2005. Uh, I did a lot of research on historical oyster extents, and there were once Huge oyster reefs, both subtitle and intertidal, scattered throughout the Lynn Haven. Uh, the site we're talking about today used to have one of those reef systems. So basically, when we restored it, we went back into where I knew historically a reef was found. And the wetland component, you know, the Lynn Haven watershed is very heavily urbanized. It used to be a mix of agriculture and wetlands. Most of the wetlands have been lost. So pretty much any wetlands we can restore. Uh, is very positive to the river system. So focused on those three different habitat types because those were the three that were most impacted. When the original watershed started to get converted over into agriculture for the most part, you had large increases in sedimentation. And, and we're talking about before 1900, back when you know Virginia Beach was basically farmland. Okay. So you had a lot of sediment going in there. Uh, that probably started to smother some of the reefs that were in there historically and made it tougher for SAV to persist as well. So then as the city urbanized, all that construction prior to uh, the Clean Water Act, they weren't really required to do anything to prevent sedimentation from say, you know, building a house. So again, huge pulses of sediment went into the water as the city urbanized. And uh, like today, what, what we find historically, when we look around, you can go to a historic reef site and it's just mud. But if you poke down two or three feet, you'll often hit the old reef. It's just been covered by mud mm. from all this agriculture and urbanization. Then we had a lot of, uh, again, the city has had a lot of uh, septic tank systems and water discharges into the Lynn Haven River. So that started to basically pollute it, increase nutrient loads. That made the SAV die back. So you had the reefs getting smothered, the wetlands being converted into other habitat types, mainly people's houses, and then um, the SAV getting impacted by water pollution. All of this together really started to heavily impact Lynn Haven probably around uh, about the 1970s is when it got really bad. That's when they had to shut down all oyster production in the, in the water because it was too polluted. So... so um, <clears throat> We're, we're basically trying to turn back the clock in the Lynn Haven, and we've made a lot of progress. You know, the city has taken out the septic systems for the most part, a um, lot better control over stormwater discharges. So it's definitely a group effort. And right now, this is the top performing reef project in Chesapeake Bay. It's uh, outcompeted my Great Wacomico project, which was the first big 
large scale restoration success. It's doing better than the Pianca tank. It's doing better than our reefs in the, um, the Elizabeth River system. And it's doing better than basically everything in Maryland. So this, this project to me is a really big deal because we're, we've done something that's really not, not been seen before in, in the Bay. And uh, I'm just really thrilled to death that it's outperformed uh, my goal metrics by a wide margin. It's really uh, amazing. We, we see that right there, too. He, he's talking about unknown unknowns, things that we did not know that we didn't know, things that we couldn't have had the foresight to even plan for. And these are the types of things that we run into when we're pioneering uh, in, an, in an environment where things are constantly changing. There's just some things that we, we can't account for until they happen. And then, you know, we, we work with our partners to kind of handle those things appropriately as they, as they arise. Yeah. I've, I've got a, a great quote. Uh, I, I don't know where my dad got it, but he gave it to me. He said, Hist- history, um, doesn't ever repeat itself, but it often rhymes. Right. So I think it's understanding is like, Hey, there's this historical thing of, um, very similar construct, but it's, there's little differences that we're kind of evolving around and figuring out how to, to get to that solution. I hadn't heard that. I actually like that a lot. Yeah. I'm going to use that. I'm stealing it. <laughs> For many years, oyster restoration was only done with oyster shell. And then they considered some other shells, whelk shell, clam shell. Um, And then they tried some different types of alternative substrates, including pelletized coal ash, porcelain toilets. um, Really? Tires, believe it or not. Because the general idea was, if you build it, they will come. And oysters will settle on almost anything, seemingly. But over time, as we tracked by the certain metrics of density and biomass and oyster shell volume and things that are readily measurable um, and easily replicated, so the standards were set, um, they saw that it wasn't just throwing something out into the water that was important, but design and substrate and the pore space for the water to be able to move through. Um, There were a lot of factors that were important and that one approach that would work in one place would not work somewhere else. And uh, Dave and I uh, and Rom Lipsius at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, we went out with a couple of hydrodynamic modelers. Uh, So their special specialty is physical modeling. They know a lot about math and a lot about how water moves. And we were driving with them in the truck and then out with them on the boat. And we didn't even get to the site that we were going to show them. And by the time we described it to them, they said, yeah, that's the worst thing you could have done or someone could have done the way that it was like a a set of mounded structures that look like an upside down eggshell carton because the nature of that design was slowing water down such that the lower portions of those reefs were becoming uh, low oxygen or no oxygen zones. So Um. nothing could really survive there if it settled there. And the slope of the reefs was so steep that once oysters grew and started to expand, especially multiple at the same time, like a cluster, they would roll down hill into the dead zone. And The fact that it only took a brief conversation with people that really understand physics to say, wow, we we probably shouldn't have been doing that. But it was the practice for years and years. And it was viewed as this, this great approach because you could build a bunch in close proximity to each other and out of the way of others that use waterways, like your recreational boaters, people on personal watercraft, even the commercial watermen that didn't want to cede any of their grounds, the public grounds or the private grounds, to restoration interests. So at that same time, as we're making certain uh, discoveries and revelations, we were observing, and this was in partnership with the Army Corps of Engineers and, and the city of Virginia Beach and Lynn Haven River Now and Chesapeake Bay Foundation, we were all trying to understand that if oysters can settle on just about anything, how can we build projects so that we get the most bang for our buck and that the, the greatest likelihood for sustainability in that it would perpetuate over time, you would not have to continue to make additional inputs and spend additional dollars to make it run and thrive. And 
so that's when we started to more systematically test different substrates, limestone marl, crushed concrete, small and large sized granite, and then prefabricated concrete structures, reef balls, pyramids, tabletop structures, oyster castles. And the more we started to zero in on these different features of what made a reef more successful than other ones, especially side by side comparisons, we, we started to really get a handle on it. And fortunately with the Army Corps of Engineers, they were trying to do things at a large, meaningful scale. That was a big part of the problem is that projects weren't being done, restoration projects were not being done at the adequate size and scale to make a meaningful and measurable difference inside of a river. Or like the Lynn Haven River system is pretty enclosed. There is only one entrance and exit at the Lesnar Bridge on Shore Drive. And if you've ever been there, the water flows in with fury and flows out with fury. But inside, the water tends to stick around for a long time. They call that residence time. And the longer that it stays, the more likely that the oyster larvae will settle inside of that river system. And if you could get them the proper substrate in the proper design and at the right locations, you could really reboot the system. And that is what Heather and Dave have been talking about and we have witnessed, but we also had to fight for, to become advocates for, um, in the face of kind of an older paradigm of how to do this type of work. Uh, the main metrics we use for this study were secondary production. And what's meant by that is the amount of animal biomass that you're getting from restoring the habitat. The reason we did that was because there's no real direct way to compare, say, an area of oyster reef versus an area of wetlands. Uh, common techniques would be to use what's called habitat units, which are simply an acre of wetlands or an acre of forest. The problem we ran into with that approach was SAV is a lot less expensive to do per acre than, say, an oyster reef. So if you're using a habitat unit approach, you're going to kick oyster reefs and wetlands out and you're just going to do all SAV. So I had to come up with this new methodology using the secondary production and that allowed us to justify all three different habitat types and get them in the water. The, the metrics that we are targeting, number of oysters in a given area, the amount of tissue that's living, that's present in those oysters, those are the first things we look for. But then more subtly, we want to make sure that we're seeing settlement of new oysters every year and hopefully enough to replace. Like right now, there are certain developed countries that are very concerned about zero or negative population growth in their countries and what effect that's going to have on their economy, that the individuals in their populations are going to be on average much older than they used to be. This is a baby boom issue. And with oyster reefs, we can be very excited about a really good settlement year that it'll, it'll carry on forever, right? The happy days are here again, but eventually they're going to grow old and become senescent and pass away. Will there be another generation of oysters waiting to replace them and to grow in that space? And so that's some of what we're looking for. But more subtly, we want to see what else is living with, what is in the oyster community? It is not an oyster monoculture that is is the most successful environment. It is a diverse environment with, as Heather was mentioning, we have the other shellfish, some of them that burrow down, some that live on the surface. Gastropods, little snails that will feed on the algae or drill into another shellfish. Hey, it's a tough life out there. It's competitive. Lots of crustaceans. We want the shrimp, the snapping shrimp, the grass shrimp, the mud crabs, the blue crabs, the little critters that by virtue of their activity, including a bunch of little fishes, gobies, blennies, oyster toadfish, that they make their living on the reef, that they really don't leave the reef. If they swim away, they don't swim far. Now the blue crabs are more mobile, but the rest of what I just described, when they find a reef, a place to live, that's where they raise the next generation. That's probably where they're going to die and where their offspring might live and grow and die. And so you get generations of supporting cast members on the reef that keep the reef growing and healthy and thriving through some of the tougher times when maybe there isn't as good a settlement. Lynn Haven's a real special place. They do well year after year, but other systems in Maryland and certainly up in, or in, in Virginia, but definitely up in Maryland, that is the big conversation. 
they are consistently having to intervene with with setting larvae in tanks on on oyster shells or other substrate and putting it back out into the river because the natural settlement that they used to rely on a hundred plus years ago just isn't occurring the way it used to for a lot of the reasons that Dave uh, and Heather were describing. So when I'm looking in the trays, I'm I'm observing and I keep notes on. Okay, do we have uh, do we have algae? Do we have sponge? Do we have mussels? How um, are we seeing them reliably, or is it rare? Is it year after year, or is it you know boom and bust? And in any given moment, you don't know if what you're collecting is critical. But when you go back to analyze it, especially over time, and maybe across different sites, maybe even different states. You might only at that moment, when you step back, be able to, to come to an important conclusion. And so that's why when I'm looking in these trays, I'm, I'm looking for a lot more than just, oh yeah, there's the count of oysters, that's how big they are, great, we're, we're fine. Um, yes, so that's, that's what goes through my head when I'm working through these samples. And you know, when I roll up to or, or <laughs> uh, glide up to on a boat or walk up to in the intertidal zone and I'm looking, I'm a little anxious. What am I going to see this year? Because sometimes you'll have a thriving reef and it doesn't look so good the next year. And you say, oh my gosh, is this, is it, is this the end of this reef? And, and what did we do wrong or what happened? What did mother nature change that we didn't account for? And, um, so that's why long-term data sets are so important. So uh, with each project that's done, there is a, ne a necessary monitoring that has to occur at specific phases of the, of the project's life. You want to go and monitor around the first year and the third year and the sixth year if you can manage. It doesn't always work out with funding cycles and political cycles, but um, that's the target so that you can identify whether the reef is, has, is on the trajectory to meet certain metrics to meet certain targets by the time they reach five or six years old. And the reason that age is selected is by year three, which is today we were just looking at the Lynn Haven Reef Balls, phase one of this ecosystem restoration project. We have a very clear sense of what things look like by the third year. And you know whether or not you're a betting person, you could probably say with confidence, this reef is going to make it, or this reef is on borrowed time, we may need to adaptively manage it. We have to intervene. Or there's something happening here that we didn't account for. We've seen this in the Lafayette River and in the Great Wacomico River that where reefs are placed at the mouth of another smaller creek, those creeks deposit a lot of sediment and there's no getting around it. You don't want to put something right at the mouth of that little creek because as the water flows into the larger river, it slows down. And as it slows, it deposits all that sediment. So now we know, and now we don't make that mistake. And if you look at the, the ancient architecture about where reefs were located, they weren't everywhere all the time. Um, they would either be consistently in certain places and not in others, or in certain shallow water environments, they would vary, they would move. The way the mouth of the Mississippi River has moved from one part of the Gulf to another over time, and it just has to do with natural shifts and changes in deposition and topography and, and other factors, some of them very large and some over very long periods of time. Now with oysters, we're not really thinking that far out, that concern, mm -hmm. but the Army Corps' goal when they do these types of projects, they have a vision of 50 years. Can this project be sustainable for 50 years? But they don't want to have to continue to take federal taxpayer dollars and invest it for 50 years. They'd like to do it either one time or a few times in the beginning and then be able to let it go and to monitor it to see if it's, if it's maintaining. With each successive project, not necessarily successful, but successive project, we learn more and more, and we've gotten to a point in our collective knowledge that we, and I say we, the entire community, when we get together, and it's so much more collaborative than it was a few decades ago, we're really working towards something approaching consensus, which, you know, when you're talking about limits of, of uh, money for budgets and, and political fuel in any given election year, which we're in one right now. 
their competing interests. But somehow we have gotten enough momentum and enough buy-in that we're able to do projects, do the monitoring, report the progress, or at least report the performance, and, and proceed in a logical fashion. And it seems like, yeah, that makes perfect sense, but that's not the way it used to be. We've seen projects and programs, this program as a whole, you're heading into 2010, we had so much momentum, it was insane. And then we hit a brick wall because there were certain stakeholders that were not happy with the way things were proceeding and they intervened and slowed that progress. And so then we had to retool. And as uh, Heather mentioned, the Chesapeake Bay uh, water, watershed agreement of 2014 was was a, a moment of pause to say we need to decide what we're going to do here because something isn't working. So sometimes the monitoring gets you those data and from a strict um, oyster density, oyster biomass, crab density, fish density, those types of things, um, we, we get that information. But there are other subtleties at play that those data don't s satisfy. But we continue to collect the information knowing full well that sometimes uh, it's, a, it's an easy year or an easy period or you get into a very difficult time. And that's when those data become even more valuable. The reason I put these trays of oysters all around the room is I wanted everybody participating today to see what I have been seeing and what Dave has been seeing. Because Heather, as a project manager, is doing so many things and managing so many different projects and managing people. I feel like I have the benefit of being able to be on site, observing, taking pictures, taking video, collecting the samples cleaning the samples, processing the samples. I have so much contact time with these animals and with these environments that I feel like it enables you to become something approaching an expert. I would call myself an expert at this point just by virtue of the number of hours I've spent doing it. But when I can put all this for everybody to see, even if you have had no previous experience, you can start to see the similarities in something that looks healthy and something that looks like it's, it's trending in the right direction. So, um, that is why we collect the data that we do, and we get together in groups, smaller groups to talk about individual projects, larger groups to talk about the direction of the program as a whole, and knowing full well that there isn't an endless amount of money to spend on these types of programs, and knowing full well that climate change is looming over us, and that what we have finally figured out that is working today may not be the solution. We may have to retool again, and one of those concerns is estuarine and ocean acidification. As the pH of water drops, it becomes more corrosive and it's harder to build a shell. And here we're fully invested in shelled organisms that if you're a three inch oyster or a three inch clam, it looks like you made it. And maybe you did, but when you're gonna put out your uh, sperm and eggs to make uh, fertilized larvae and they're swimming around with the tiniest of invisible microscopic shells, they are fully vulnerable to that acidic water. And we've been pretty fortunate on the east coast of the United States, but on the west coast where they do aquaculture and they get all of this very acidic water, this low oxygen water, come up from deeper along the continental shelf. It gets into the estuaries and <clears throat> can kill just all the larvae that are floating around in the, in the open water and even within aquaculture systems. So these are the, the, the new challenges that are awaiting us here in the 21st century. We finally figured out our 20th century issues and we're, we're trying to bring the best science and to get ahead of what could curtail progress. Because one thing I will say, and you all probably know this, is that everybody loves a winner, but people's attention span just doesn't hold over time. And so the best we can do is consistently try to anticipate what the next challenge is going to be and, and position ourselves so that we deal with it before someone can say, especially say in DC, oh yeah, this program's going nowhere, we're gonna pull that funding. And that would really be a, a, a true shame at this point because of what we know and how successful things have been. And uh, we recognize that this goal, and, and Heather mentioned the goal, and Dave and I know the goal very well. It goes all the way back to President Obama's executive order 13508 in 2009. They were shooting for 20 tributaries by 2025. In 2014, we whittled it down to 10, which was probably the more realistic goal to begin with. But 2025 is next year. What are we gonna do going forward? 
When I said the Lynn Haven River Now 2007, what are you going to call yourself after 2007? Oh, I guess we got to figure that out. Lynn Haven River Now. Great. Can't go wrong with that name. And it always feels present. What are we going to do after 2025? And that is the next big conversation that we're having. So what they're talking about here is kind of difficult because, you know, even here between the two of us, the way that we see the world, the way that we define success is going to be quite different, I imagine. Wait, how do you personally define success? Yeah, I think there are like, you know, multiple concepts behind that. And I it was really appreciative when you asked me this question initially mm-hmm. or when I saw it on the initial notes. I, I think like from a military standpoint, I think everyone defines success as battalion command. And for me, that in my mind, that's a successful career, right? Mm-hmm. 20 years to your nation. But I think it goes much more beyond that in terms of life. Like all of my successes are not necessarily what I've done and accomplished, but it's watching my subordinates, my daughters, my wife continue to excel, uh, my family continue to excel based on the inputs that I've put into their lives to be better. And their successes at the end of the day mean that I've been successful. It's a very elaborate picture of success, kind of hard to It's It's hard, to right? That's why I'm saying, like, that's what I said. when we had this, you know, read up beforehand, um, that's kind of how I've always driven my career um, over the last 15 years. Recently, I've been maintaining kind of a microscopic view, and I've just been asking myself, is what I did today more than I did yesterday? Is it better, or did I at least maintain? Yeah. Have, have I not? Because I've, I've had periods of my life where I've drifted backwards quite a bit, so like, did I at least do the same or do better than I did yesterday? And that's kind of where I'm at right now. But 1% better every day is exponentially greater over 365 days, right? And that's what right. we're really looking at is if you're going 1% up or 1% down each day. And those are the challenges that we're constantly facing. Definitely. 100%. You know, and I, I, th- I think for uh, my success in the district is leaving this place better than I found it. I want to be a, a valuable member of this team. I want to contribute to the team and I want to help make this place better. Um, it's the same thing that we talked about earlier. It's those 1% increments of improving the organization and leaving your mark. And then we could also take it as far as the, you know, looking at the mission of our organization and the vision, there isn't any particular mile marker on there. And you know, it's no. just providing those engineering solutions, effective engineering solutions for the toughest challenges. It doesn't say when that ends. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's the same thing, like I, I sat down in the uh, Chesapeake Bay restoration project with uh, Heather last week, and you know, the project that they were talking about over at Changier was a 10 year project. So I'm not even get to see the end state of it. I mean, I get to see it, you know, down the road, but I just want to be able to do what I can here while I'm here to help shape as much as I can to get at building the future. When we look at an individual river system, we look at the historic oyster population that was once there and the types of surveys that we do today to determine those populations didn't exist decades ago, certainly not hundreds of years ago. So we have to work with the harvest data that was reported to the state and to the federal government as far back as the mid 1800s. And we referenced that to say, okay, you couldn't possibly have those types of, of harvests if it wasn't a sustainable population at that time. And so what did the population look like then? And do we have to replicate those that number of oysters or that amount or acreage of uh, three-dimensional oyster reef habitat in order for a river to be considered to be restored. And that was a big part of when Dave was working on the Great Wacomico River uh, project, which was post Tangier, Pocomoke Sound and Rappahannock in its earliest of stages. And and again, Dave will speak to this, but um, recognizing that there is a certain percentage of the original historic population that you have to restore in order for the river to function the way it once did. And we do this knowing full well that we are not going to be able to change the inputs of sediment that were there a few hundred years ago. So now we're at like seven times the volume of, of sediment that flows into a given river in any given year. And that's not even taking into account major storms. And so if we know that that these watersheds, the land you know where the water flows down into this, these basins, um, 
are permanently altered essentially because we're not going to go back to old growth forest across the whole um, watershed, then our targets have to be realistic, but they also have to take into account these these historic data, these historic populations, and that that only targets like that, only goals that are that, that grand will ever get us to a point where we can say, okay, it's a success. We can say that we're quote unquote done for oyster restoration in this body of water at this time. I am personally am very hesitant to do that anywhere, but I recognize that the federal partners and the federal dollars that are spent year after year have to, there has to be accountability and they have to have an idea of when they can withdraw just the same way as when we enter into a foreign nation for military reasons. It's not with the idea that we are going to be there forever. So what is the exit strategy? And so I would say that, uh, I'd like to queue up Dave specifically for how these goals were set and the sense of when can we declare restoration or victory or that we're ready to move on to some other even more challenging river. Like the James River is monstrously big. The Rappahannock River, the Potomac River, they're very large. Can we take what we've learned from these places that we've been working and make similar headway in those other systems? So. Dave, take it away. <laughs> uh, what's the question again? <laughs> <laughs> so my question was regarding success, how, how you would define it, mm -hmm. given that there are so many things that could change the way a particular waterway looks over time. It is, there's, nev there's a natural evolution to it. Oh, it's yeah. always changing. Mm -hmm. if, how do you, how do you, what do you call a finish line? Well, uh, for, let's say for the reef component first, uh, what I would look for is, and I developed a, the gold number, the secondary production number. I base that on a lot of homework, looking at uh, what historical documentation was available, and then I came up with that particular number. So that's the first goal. Second goal is you want to see a system response. So. Uh, the system response you get on the oyster component is, do you see increased oyster recruitment in the system? And when Russ is talking today about a spat set of over 3,000 oysters per square meter, I can tell you that that is a system response. The recruitment was not that high before we built the reef system before. So we're getting a system-wide response. So any hard substrate out there is gonna have more oysters on it now. And also, uh, you might get a little bit of natural reef recovery. You know, when those clusters fall off, they're going to start building their own little natural reefs. So that's an, a habitat area recovery. So that's part of the system response too. So all those things together. Uh, now for <clears throat> the fish component of those reefs, what we want to see, I uh, was especially excited about the uh, black sea bass nursery habitat that it uh, is providing. That's a very common fish species. It's pretty tasty. I've eaten them many times. And um, they are reef dependent. So no reef, no black sea bass. So when we put that reef system in there, now all those little black sea bass larvae that get sloshed into the Lynn Haven, they have a home now. So they can feed, grow, and uh, some of them will be uh, you know, caught and tossed on the grill. So that's another part of the system response. You want increases in your fish population, you know, and also your blue crabs, your clams, and this habitat's providing all that. So uh, it's not just attracting fish to the reef from other areas, it's creating them it's because easy. of the increase in biomass, the increase in food availability. So you get an overall increase in, you know, your fish populations, your clams, crabs. So it's good news for everybody. And for the SAV, the seagrass component, pretty much the same thing. Um, seagrass were in terrible shape. Uh, a lot of people thought that um, you couldn't even do seagrass restoration so in that uh, river at all. So what I came up with is a multiple species strategy. We're using two species. One is eelgrass, which is the one that's done in the Chesapeake Bay program. The problem it has is because of climate change. It's the temperature is getting hot to the point where eelgrass has a difficult time persisting. So 
we are trying to restore it. It's going to be very challenging, but we're also restoring another species along with it, widgeon grass, which is much more temperature tolerant. So if the eelgrass doesn't take, we'll fall back onto the widgeon grass. And in nature, they're usually found together anyway. So uh, that's how we reduce our risk of failure there. Now, seagrass provides really critical, uh, important nursery habitat for blue crabs in particular. So if we can establish it in there, everyone who throws a crab pot in there is going to be happier, uh, among other things. So um, those are some metrics that I would say, you know, I use. I'm trying to conceptualize, you know, how you guys are treating this biological problem. And the first comparison that comes to my mind is like, oh, it's like, it's like treating an infection in, in, in the body. Now, when you guys are, are engaged in these ecosystem restoration projects, for each area that you're working on, is it like a day of taking an antibiotic or is it more like getting the, the injection, the one-time injection of penicillin and then you're good to go? That's a tough one as far as that, uh, that analogy goes. The way uh, I've come to look at it is before we adulterated nature, it functioned a certain way and it functioned really well for what seemed like forever as far as humans are concerned. So my approach is, can we mimic that? Can we hand back off to nature the role of making the waterways replete with oysters and mussels and crabs and shrimp and fish and seagrass? And if we can do that, then one, we've been successful by economic metrics because we did it quickly and we didn't have to keep going back and redoing it. But two, I feel like the, that essence of hope <laughs> that a lot of us don't have so much anymore. like the more, you know, the let, the more you, you, you reduce your ignorance about information <laughs> in the world, the harder it is to get up in the morning and to put your clothes on and go do your job. But I feel, and I see with the members of this community, a lot of hope like legitimate hope and that 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 sense that we are actually making forward progress is what I'm targeting. I, I see that as the success. The fact that, you know, they say, uh, I'll know it when I see it. I think we now know what it looks like and we know what to do in general to get there with an understanding that Conditions vary place to place, and so your approach is going to have to adjust to meet the demands of that environment and knowing full well that some places are just genuinely challenging to work in. That takes me to my next question, and that's about communication and community involvement. So I really enjoyed how you were describing the entire process of you know learning. You keep on going out to a site, and you had one idea, but then you, you invite a, a physicist out there, and... They give you more information and it completely changes your perspective and your approach, right? As you're learning to do your job better and, and to become intimately familiar with how the ecosystem works, right? How are you communicating the, your successes and the impact on, on the people who live here and also the economy? Because you mentioned the economy as well before. So how... how or, or is that also an evolution, just like the process itself, the natural process? I think that Heather and Dave both could speak to this in part because it's their job to be thinking this way. <laughs> and if there's anything left when they're done, I'll jump in. One way was when we saw to see, started to see some early successes, we actually put in for a, a White House award called the Coastal America Partnership Award. And that was a whole group of us, the Army Corps, um, all the nonprofits, City of Virginia Beach, a bunch of scientists, and we won. And um, that definitely, you know, raised the profile of the project and started to get the good word out. And I'll let Heather take it from there. Well, we, we have really tried to engage the public um, through every, I mean, through any core project, starting from the initial scoping phase through the planning phase. There are a number of required public meetings, um, both at the core house and through the permitting phase, through um, VMRC. You know, we have to, we're required to. So we try to do as much outreach, get the word out there as possible. Um, 
but I think that and, and economic benefits and things like that. Um, I think there's a there's stuff that's coming down the pipeline that's really going to tie in economic benefits and environmental restoration projects like this. Um, not enough to share now, but I think just knowing that there is going to be a tie-in, I think that's coming that um, folks way way smarter than me are, are working on um, to help tell that story. Also, it's an I mean money talks, so it's a, it's another way to help continue the progress towards future restoration projects and continue funding future restoration projects. Um, but I I think numbers talk also, and and as they were. Um, you know, talking about the the metrics and and I think what what I just can't, can't wrap my head around or I can wrap my head around, but it's just amazing to me is you know uh, Russ is estimating like 19.7 million oysters now have a home on our phase one reef, so that's 19.7 million oysters that if our reef wasn't there they wouldn't be there. Now not all of them are adult, so not all of them are gonna live to that statistic that many people know as an adult oyster is filtering 50 gallons of water a day. But regardless, even if it's a fraction of that, that is so many more filter feeders. So improving water quality, so much more habitat to Dave's point, black sea bass. There's, there was no habitat for black sea bass at that location. Now we have that. So I think trying to, at least that's what I'm hopeful for this, this podcast and for any additional public outreach is that we can, we can now, show what what we did why we did it in a way that's um just going to be beneficial to to all in the Lynn Haven. I mean when we were out there last time we saw dolphins back there um I mean all the things that that Rom and Vims has been seeing Rom and Rochelle all the other critters besides just the oysters I mean it's just it's so hopeful um and I I am glad that you know, Russ mentioned the word hope because I have hope. My daughter thinks that she says my, my job is, is uh, I, I work with oysters. That's what, that, what she's, what she tells people is I work with oysters, which is, which is awesome. I'm not, I mean, I do work with oysters, but I, you know, I have other, other things too, but I, you know what, if that's what she wants and then I can help instill some hope in the importance of oysters and restoration and have her be part of our oyster uh, team, then. So obviously within every subgroup, social sector, profession, microcosm, whatever it may be, you know, everyone has, when they're completely immersed in their field, they end up developing a very particular way of viewing the world. And that way of viewing the world obviously is going to differ from those of people who are not in that field, people who haven't read the same book, people who aren't involved in the same projects. And it's those differences sometimes that makes that make communication a little bit difficult. Sure. Because yeah. we're speaking from the frame of reference of things that we know. And if they're so common to us, we may not e- very effectively communicate those things to somebody else who doesn't know those things. So I was out there with my public affairs colleague, Alicia, and she, and she coined the term <laughs> oyster people. That's so, classic. <laughs> yeah, I, I enjoyed it quite a bit. I think they did too. But that... All of this brings me to to this point, I, and I ended up asking them, what do oyster people talk about when they get together? What do oyster people worry about that those who are driving by these waterways over, over the bridges every single day don't worry about because they don't have your same perspective? Where we are now is so different than where we were 20 years ago. And Heather, I think you arrived in your CBF role just when things were starting to get more cordial. But we, Dave and I, in the early 2000s, and really throughout the 2000s and part of the teens, uh, were fighting some significant battles and were in a real minority position, especially because we were graduate students and, and uh, the data seemed so clear, but it was flying in the face of both the current paradigms of restoration at the time and the extreme political and economic momentum to make a different choice after decades of population of decline because of disease and loss of habitat. And Dave mentioned the Clean Water Act when it emerged, but like any environmental regulation, it took a, a long time before some of those benefits were realized. And the types of programs that exist today are so comprehensive and so long lasting that we're really starting to see some of those benefits. But the message 
that I would say is that in any given day, when I talk to Dave or to Heather or to Peyton or to other members of this community, we have elation and then we have uh, some concern for what will the future look like? Is there a push to pivot towards some of the same old spend spread your money as far as you can to get the most seeming potential benefit, but maybe go right back to where we started, where we lose the appreciation for the height of reefs, for the shape of reefs, for where you put them, and really just try to say, we want to get to that success victory lap as fast as possible so we can move on to the next one. Um, so that's part of what comes up in our conversations. But for me personally, and Dave, We've been at this a long time. We have taken a number of career hits in the positions that we held. Now, everything seems good today, and today has been a great day, and we are in a great place in this program. But we, personally and professionally, have sacrificed more than can be communicated in any podcast. And our concern is that if we step away from the table, will will there be individuals or will there be the collective will to say the difficult things to, to come to the conclusions that are based on the data and not based on the pressure to come to one conclusion or, or another? Because there was a time when the push was to say how everything was going to fail. And that was the main position. And to be against that was to be naive or to be a problem that needed to be pushed out of the room so consensus could be established. Now it's the reverse, right? We want to say everything's great. Oh, we're doing so wonderfully. But we know in history that you can wave a flag and get all excited. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you are on the path to sustainability and perpetuity um, of, of productivity and, and economic prosperity. And so we try to simultaneously be appreciative of where we are, which is so much better than where we were, but be very aware that we could end up somewhere uh, less productive. And really, we don't want to lose the faith of the voting public, of the citizenry, of the community, because scientists have lost a lot of credibility over the years in part because there are factions that want to muddy the waters that want to say oh we're going to have a fair and balanced discussion about climate change here's the person who's for it and here's the person who's against it but that's not representative of the academic and professional community where it's 99 percent of the population agrees that there's these problems that it's mostly human caused or enhanced and then there's an extreme minority that has this other position but the media doesn't want to show that because there's no that's the end of the conversation before it starts consensus doesn't allow for the meaty discussions and the way to kind of put people against one another. So if we are in a position now where we feel like consensus exists and we know how to do this, will people lose interest? Will the government lose interest? I think the one thing we really have going for us is that the concerns of long-term effects of climate change and the, and the fact that we don't have good data to tell us where we're headed because no human being has ever witnessed where we're headed means that what we're doing will be maintained as an important part of the overall strategy for climate and coastal resilience. And that includes communities, that includes people, that includes property. And that will keep us relevant, not so we can get the next grant dollars. I want to be able to walk away from this or be pulled away from it kicking and screaming because I love it so much, but I want that day to come where I know it will carry on because we're doing the right things together. Not that there's a handful of people that are holding it together and the minute that they go, it all starts to collapse under those external pressures. And in this election year, the things that we are witnessing are fine examples of just how off the rails things can get. So that is what we talk about amidst <laughs> our aging bodies. <laughs> yeah, we, we've definitely uh, got some war stories to tell. When I got involved in oysters, the whole program was deemed a failure. The scientific community, the fishery management, uh, everybody. And 
I was given the lead of this program. So I'm sitting there going, okay, you're telling me I can't succeed, but yet uh, I'm in charge. So uh, it was a very interesting challenge, and I made some big changes to the program. Um, one, which is what we're doing right now, is what's called sanctuary reefs. No one can fish for oysters on the reef that we've been talking about in the Lynn Haven today because it's built out of these reef balls. So all the way up to basically me, I would think, um, all the habitat that was being restored was immediately then fished um, by the oyster fishermen. So to make that change was probably the most difficult thing I had done in my career. And I, I had survived uh, repeated attempts to get me fired over that one. Um, so me and Russ, when we get together, we talk about that stuff because we were, we were kind of in the trenches during the worst part of it. And, uh, you know, when I went into the Lynn Haven, I was told that there were never any subtitle oyster reefs in it and that there were already enough oysters in it. So why waste your time going in there? And that, that was from the broad scientific uh, community and a lot of the federal agencies too. So, you know, everyone gets along now, but... Back then, I was broadly opposed to even trying to plan a project in the Lynn Haven River. And, um, you know, when I planned this feasibility study that we're talking about the results of today with the seagrasses and the reefs and the wetlands, I was, again, broadly opposed. Um, Virginia Institute of Marine Science wrote that letter saying basically nothing we're proposing is going to make any difference, and it was all going to fail. And so, I probably had the most unpleasant meeting of my career with uh, Army headquarters, uh, briefing them on this and fighting for the project. And I was successful, but I mean, it, you know, the challenges that this program has faced have just been enormous. And, you know, what Russ is talking about long term, you know, when people like us leave. Uh, what is going to happen? You know, everyone's getting along now, which is fantastic. It's great to see. But that is not the way it started out. <laughs> and it's not the way it was for quite a long time either. And I hope that this positive momentum, everyone working together, continues. And, you know, the Oyster Restoration Program is one of the great successes in the Chesapeake Bay Restoration Program in general. I mean, we are on track to restore oysters to five trips in Virginia and five trips in Maryland by 2025. And this project here we're talking about is part of that. So, you know, everyone involved should be very proud of the contributions, you know, to get us where we're at right now. And you asked earlier how we communicate. We publish. We publish in peer reviewed journals. We published reports. And one of those reports had to be brought to Congress at the time when that non-native oyster introduction was on the verge of being decided. Um, so we've really put ourselves out there at times and it's nice to not have to do that or not to feel like you're doing it on your own, right? They feel like you're by yourself. And um, one thing that all of this has taught me is that uh, you're not guaranteed to have an easy path in your career. And if you want to hold a position of principle, then you're really not guaranteed it. <laughs> so you, it, and, and it can be very lonely, but I don't feel so alone anymore. And it's nice to feel like we held the line long enough for others to be able to get on the boat and to, and for us to be floating in the right direction. But, you know, and, and, and we would talk about people in history who have done hard things and we didn't have to, you know, fight for like in the revolutionary war, but we were fighting a war. It just was not recognized by most people around us as something that we should be getting so worked up about. <laughs> See, when I hear you guys, all three of you, when I hear you guys talk about this topic, you guys obviously sound passionate. No one groomed you in that direction. You guys just found it. Right. So, do you see like of your students, for example, even or of new um, biologists or engineers coming to to the core? Are you seeing that passion kind of build momentum among new people to the field currently? I think we're seeing it right here. Some of these people in this room are giving me the faith that 
there's just like you want that next generation of oysters on the reef, we want the next generation of people willing to stand in the face of something that might be temporally unpopular, like unpopular today, and it might be very popular tomorrow. And to know that there are political cycles and we go through them and to to, to enjoy the, the, the crest of the wave when you get it, but to know you'll be in the trough a year or two from now. And that's what I'm thinking about. We had that bipartisan um, bill that was passed that brought so much money, federal dollars, to Chesapeake Bay and other parts of the, the country. And that money may not be there. That type of money may not be there going forward. And which programs are going to be able to survive the the, the, the famine stage of feast or famine. We are in feast and famine is likely coming. And I have faith in this program that it will stand and carry forward. But again, it's based in the good data collection and the way we communicate, the way we promote. I mean, Dave and I have been talking about self-promotion. We've been mostly selfless for so many years to try to do something for the environment. But now we have to say, well, geez, one day we might have to retire or what kind of money do we have in the bank for ourselves? We have to really think about that. Um, and if we start to make some of those choices that seem a bit more um, selfish to the outside world, we're, have we paid our dues? And that's what I think about with students. I try to help them to understand that, that, when you take something, take on something that's very challenging or seems unwinnable, um, there are lots of stories of people that came before you and people that are even doing it right now. And so when Dave and I would get together with the select few individuals that wanted to stand in the face of the, of the majority at the time, we spent a lot of time looking at the historical documents, looking at what had previous scientists done. I mean, we have been able to experience something that multiple generations of scientists have never been able to enjoy. And then they sacrificed their entire lives to it. And it still didn't happen because it wasn't the right time in history to fight against the practices of the day. So um, I am grateful for that. But I recognize that we are not guaranteed this degree of support. Um, ad infinitum and that breeding to a degree that next generation or those next generations of willing participants is absolutely key and but also being honest with them like I don't when students come in and they're bright eyed and bushy tailed and very positive about the future you know I don't want to tell them oh, don't go into it trust me you don't want to do what I just did what Dave and I just went through <laughs> but I also uh, don't want to tell them that it's it's just going to be great because they they see these stories like this podcast will be so positive to them like oh my gosh I want to do that I mean I can if I can have that type of influence and impact you know what a dream and yes it can be but like any dream there are some dark times and you wonder what's going to be the story of your life right where do you find meaning in your life I find some of it here and the rest of it in my family and so. Those are just choices, things that I've decided to focus on and to, to, to judge me. I'm not waiting for judgment day. I'm doing it every day. And that's what I would say. If I had one last word to anyone who's listening is to be able to look yourself in the mirror and have an honest, uh, I guess, uh, what, what is the word that they say that when, when you, you take stock, right? Take stock of who you are and where you're at and whether you want to alter something to get to where you really feel like you need to be. And sometimes you're in the right place at the right time, but it might be the hard time. But, and that's what Dave and I said. And that, so that's what I'll finish with. We were in the middle of this big fight for years and we, we did not have the protection of tenure. We did not have the protection of being independently wealthy. We just decided this is, this is our task at this time. We will take it on and and then we'll see what happens, right? And there were plenty of times where it looked like it wasn't gonna work out. And we tried to bolster each other with, with a handful of other uh, members in our, on our team. And now that, that we've seen the maturity of the program, and so many, I mean, when I say so many, everywhere I look, all the agencies that used to not be able to agree on anything are all moving in the same direction. 
if there was ever a time where we really could take advantage of this and double down and, and really soar, it's now. It's now. And I think that that the world, or at least the nation, needs these types of stories because there's so much out there that's negative. And I understand it. When I flip through the phone, I'm like, what am I looking at? Oh, there's another negative story. Let me see what they're saying there. You know, there's drama there. But then it's like, oh, here's this happy ending story. I don't know how I feel about a happy ending story. I'm ready for some more tumultuous fighting. Um, And so when Dave and I started to see things improve again, part of you doesn't believe it. Part of you says, oh, no, no, this is They're just going to pull the rug out from under us again. And it takes quite some time before you believe that things might actually work out. So um, I don't I don't know if that's a uh, like a protective feature of being a human being, an animal to not trust what you see in front of you. But uh, looking around the room at the people here and looking at all of these samples and being out there on these projects, um, I feel very positive about the future, at least this future. You know, when I started working for the Army Corps and uh, I faced all these issues with the Oyster Program, uh, the politics and everything, it was a big shock for me. And I I took a lot of hits to get things rolling along and uh, start to show the early successes. And then now, you know, everyone's working together, which is fantastic. Uh, But I will say that all the projects that I've worked on at the Army Corps in the ecosystem restoration realm, the Oyster Projects, the Slin Haven Project, you know, I've had the opportunity to do large scale uh, projects that really help the environment in the Chesapeake Bay region. And that to me is very well worth the hits that I took earlier on. And I'm glad I had the opportunity uh, working with the Army Corps that gave me the chance to do these projects because most scientists never get to manipulate uh, the system you're studying. You know, you just go out and take a look at something. But I got to go out there and fix it. And uh, I'm really thankful I had those opportunities uh, working with the Corps that gave me these chances to do it. So I did come into the oyster world when things were turning. And so what I saw was just everyone in a room. And like I mentioned, the interagency meetings were my favorite. Um, <laughs> not because, not because I, I also met my husband there, but, um, but because it was, it seemed like everyone was just getting along. I didn't understand that there had, you know, been, it hadn't always been like that. And so, you know, I, I also hope that the partnerships continue to grow, that maybe we start engaging new partnerships. Maybe there's more, um, that we can add to it, more layers beyond just specifically, you know, um, Easter for one one group in particular, you know, maybe there's different layers in the future. And the, the challenges that I've faced for this project specific was mainly dealing with the public. And so I can't imagine what they went through with dealing with um, also colleagues and in, interagency in um, disagreements. And I, I can't imagine. And so I'm thankful that um, they, not thankful they went through it, but thankful that they worked through it. And we are where we are today. So we have these great projects. And I guess I think for me, one of my future kind of um, hopes and challenges is is now looking at our, the, the other element of this project, the SAV. Um, it, it's turned to be, you know, potentially going to be a failure. Is it going to work in the Lynn Haven system? And so uh, I hope that we are kind of where we were with oysters, where the folks were saying the return of the native oyster isn't going to, wasn't going to, isn't going to work. It's not. Gonna, and now look where we are. We, we made it. Um, you know, and now there's still much, a lot to learn, but a lot of lessons learned in the past. And so whether we, you know, restore SAV in the way that the core and the Virginia Eastern Marine Science are thinking it now, or maybe we continue to build lessons learned and there's a different way. Maybe there's the multi-species approach that that Dave mentioned um maybe there's something else that we aren't thinking yet but I'm just hopeful that 20 years from now we can say oh look at that we actually did restore another critical habitat why the passion if you yourself won't see it I guess for me it's kind of one of my basic philosophical you know reasons I get out of bed and I really think that as a, a human you should, at the end of the day, know that you've made the world a better place with you being in it. And to me, what I'm, my work is allowing me to do that. 
And, you know, there is a little Johnny Appleseed vibe to the work in the sense that, you know, you're running around restoring all these habitats. And, you know, I'm not going to see what the Great Wacomico looks like uh, years from now. I'm not going to probably get to see exactly how the Lynn Haven turns out. You know, who knows where life will take me. But I know that I did the best I could to make the world a better place. And so that's kind of what drives me to keep doing it. You know, listen to that. It's really cool to see that they all want to make this a better place. And now mm-hmm. I kind of see why you call this our legacy of continued improvement. Right. Um, so it's really cool to kind of see it come full circle after listening to all this stuff. It's not going to happen overnight. And as you can see from Dave, like 21 years of working on this, it's there's you know there's no end game but potentially for him, right? Right. It's going to continue to keep being a problem set. Um, the but torch it's, gets passed on. Yeah. And but he's doing it because he wants to set up the people of the future for success. Same thing that we talked about, I think it's going back to the very first podcast of why you're doing this for your kids. Right. Right? Same thing that I'm doing it for my kids and everyone here, we're doing it for the local populace. So I think that's really good that they're able to establish their legacy here um, and hopefully it continues to grow and we get to where we need to be. And I, and I hope that their passion continues to grow and that they're able to somehow transmit that same level of passion to people who are coming after them as well. Now, I could have ended the discussion there, but I had one more question that I wanted to ask them since it had been such an edifying and interesting conversation the entire time. Primarily because I know that before I worked at USACE, I, you know, you think, I mean, you hear U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, you, my, at least for me, I immediately think it's something kinetic. Yeah. I wouldn't have imagined that they would be involved in oysters, but even beyond that, it's hard for me to think that something done right here in in Norfolk or anywhere in Hampton Roads will have an effect in the greater Chesapeake Bay. I mean, this is just a drop in the bucket, right? Or at least it seems that way to me. So I had to ask him, do the efforts in these five tributaries that they're focused on right now, do they have an effect in the larger Chesapeake Bay? Does what's happening here affect the the quality of the water up up north, say in Maryland, for example? Historically, it was believed, and I, I believe it, that the bay oyster population was connected through what's called a metapopulation. So you'll have your Lynn Haven population and your Elizabeth River population and your Harris uh, Creek population in Maryland. But by virtue of all of these different reef systems existing and thriving really simultaneously, pre-Columbian, right, before the 1600s, um, they all did, they all were connected, maybe not in any given year, but across the board, they were contributing to each other. So if you had a wet year or a dry year, or the winds were prevailing from this direction or that direction, or and any of those variables that we talked about, that when, um, when you took into consideration that the whole system was functional and connected, then the benefits from one were felt downstream, but you would never really be able to recognize and point at, oh, this came from that and this was from this other place because it was all just operating as a, as a system supposed to. But now it's all disconnected. So we are focusing on a tributary, like a river by river basis, because there's no way to fix the whole bay simultaneously. But yes, what Maryland does has an impact on Virginia and vice versa. Um, so the big project that is now being undertaken based on everything we know um, in the Tangier Pocomoke Sound region is going to put to the test, does our science translate to success in this larger, more open water environment? And granted, there's going to be a lot more money, a lot more effort put into it, but do we carry the day there? And if we do, how much will the surrounding systems in Maryland and Virginia, because it's right on the border of the two states, will they benefit from these efforts, from this restoration? And uh, so in any given day, a drop of water from up in Maryland doesn't make its way down into the Lynn Haven River. A lot of that is flowing in or just coming off of the land. But what happens in one system can impact another. and. Dave and and Heather and maybe Peyton heard earlier this week about some of these hydrodynamic modeling results for that region of Tangier Pocomoke Sound. And Dave um, told me later in the day what he had heard. And it was really impressive because it shows just the way certain areas are connected and contribute so much to surrounding environments. 
And though they can be a great, great contributor to other places, they don't receive very much from anywhere else. So if they are not successful on their own, then they may be left to languish. And that's where the science and the math comes in. Like you cannot just look at a map and know that, right? You've got to collect the information and then have faith in those who are interpreting it that they know what the heck they're doing. That's all for this episode. Thanks for tuning into the Core Talk podcast. Please like, share, and subscribe if you've enjoyed this conversation and found the information to be interesting or useful. Your feedback matters. Remember to comment with any ideas or questions you may have regarding U.S. Army Corps of Engineers projects within your community. Episodes come out the first Wednesday of every month. Until next time.